necessary copies. Uh, now, why am I talking about BSD? Well, Linux has has the same has a compatible VM, um, and you can use that for uh, packet filtering as in as in BSD. You can also use it together with the uh, secure computing uh, or SecComp uh, for sandboxing programs and uh, restricting what system calls they can make. So instead of looking at the um, looking at the headers of an incoming network packet. It will look at the uh, system call number and parameters and say yes or no or kill this program now. It's bad. Uh, and you can also use the, uh, you can also use BPF filter code uh, in your firewall with the XTBPF module and for uh, uh, network share dealing. Uh, but as time has gone out, it's gone. I'm going to move this away slightly. As time has gone on, it's still echoing a bit. As time has gone on, uh, network packet rates have increased a lot, and this use for system calls uh, means you potentially have a much higher rate. The, the filter code is being run many more times per second, and so the performance of the uh, interpreter is kind of a problem. So starting with... Uh, Linux 3.0, uh, the kernel has gained uh, just-in-time compiler so that the uh, filtering code is, is turned into native code inside the kernel. Um, and that's been implemented for several different architectures listed there. Uh, however, this feature is disabled by default. There are still some concerns about whether the generated code is, the native code is actually correct in all cases. And there's some security concerns about do you really want programmers to be able to generate native code in the kernel? Even if it's based on a very restricted language, which is supposedly safe, there are some, there are some risks. Uh, uh, and the, the, the Berkeley uh, the virtual machine uh, used for BPF, it's a 32-bit machine. It only has two registers, which is... Kind of weird. It has a bit of a stack, um, but it doesn't really match what how modern CPUs work. So yeah, there's a limit to what you can do um, in terms of efficiency. So extended BPF is this new feature. Uh, it supports sensible condi conditional branches. In BPF, if you have a conditional branch, it's, it says, if this condition is true, branch to here. If it's false, branch to there. And in real programs, normally you only want to branch in one case, uh, and that makes it uh, the um, um, the CPU should be able to do should be able to predict branches, and it really can't if you have uh, if you have this weird double double branching instruction. So eBPF has single condition branches. Sorry, simple branches has 64 bit registers and more of them, has more memory, it can do uh, byte order conversion, uh, arithmetic right shift, it can do atomic adds. And it can, uh, as well as, so a standard BPF program just returns uh, a single number, uh, and in practice usually it's a, it's a zero or one, yes or no. Um, Extended BPF supports associative arrays, and those can be mapped both into the filter program and into and uh, read only into user land. And the, so the filter code can then uh, update a histogram or other statistics. Uh, or we can even uh, provide a kind of a log and a, a ring buffer. Uh, so as yet, this is not usable for set comp, unfortunately. Um, it is usable for packet filtering. It's useful for network scheduling. And you can use it on on trace points, if you uh, insert trace points into the kernel, you can have a, this filter code to control um, what's actually done when that trace point is hit. Uh, and this, so because it's a 64-bit machine, unfortunately, you, you are unlikely to see JIT compilation for any 32-bit architectures, but who cares about them anyway? You have JIT compilation for ARM64 and AMD64 now. Uh, it's still turned off by default. Yeah, turn it on if you want. To, if you uh, think it's safe enough. 
Uh, and in fact, the BPF interpreter has been removed. All BPF programs get converted into extended BPF and interpreted like that, and that turns out to be faster, simply because uh, this is better, better uh, suited to the way modern CPUs work. Uh, BPF is a, both BPF and eBPF are their machine codes, um, but uh, there is work in progress to allow you to uh, compile to eBPF from a restricted set of C uh, using the client compiler. So next feature, an entirely di uh, different note, is the overlay file system. It's uh, a union file system that lets you, uh, uh, lets you take a read-only base file system. So that could be uh, perhaps a network NFS server or a, well, in this case, not an NFS server. But you could have a read-only medium. Um, for example, it's a live CD or, or, or similar or a shared uh, base file system for um, uh, containers. And, and then on top of that, you add a second file system that contains all the changes that have been made. And the overlay FS uh, presents a unified view of those two or more, uh, two or potentially more uh, layers. Uh, Debian has already had a union file system for quite a few, quite a few years in order to support the Debian Live projects and uh, also derivatives such as Tails. And that's AUFS. But AUFS is big and complicated and written in slightly odd style. Uh, so there's basically no, no chance that that's going to go into Linux mainline. Um, and however, over AFS is a bit simpler and it has gone in. Um, and as of uh, Linux 4.1, we're, we're not, no, sorry, it was a bit earlier than that. But currently, we're, uh, we're not including AUFS in the kernel packages anymore. Um, so the limitations of OverlayFS, uh, it doesn't seem to work or it doesn't, doesn't work correctly on top of NFS uh, file systems. You can use it to join local file systems at the moment. You can't export an OverlayFS uh, over NFS. Um, deleting, whenever you delete a file that was present on the read-only file system, you need the upper layer that contains changes needs to contain a sort of a dummy file to say ignore the file on the read-only layer. That's called a whiteout. Uh, they're not implemented very efficiently on OverlayFS. Uh, whenever you modify a file that was on the that comes from the read-only lower layer, layer that has to be copied up to the upper layer, um, and OverlayFS is a bit silly about copying it up. Sparse files. Uh, uh, and so AU, AUFS has an intriguing feature where you can have more than one writable layer. Not sure quite how that works. OverlayFS doesn't do it yet. And link trees. Unfortunately, if you create, even creating a hard link to a file that's on the read only layer requires that file to be copied up currently in OverlayFS. Uh, which is not necessary in it, not necessary in, it, in AUFS. Hopefully, some of these uh, uh, limitations uh, are going to get fixed in AUFS eventually. So, moving on to networking features, uh, there, there's a new new way of managing switches. As you probably know, Linux is used on a whole bunch of network appliances, uh, wireless access points switches, routers, uh, and yeah. So you have a bunch of things where, where you have a, a hardware switch integrated into the, into the system, and generally those are configured using an API that's specific to that vendor's dri driver. Um, you also see on PCI Express network cards, uh, a lot of them have uh, features to support virtualization, uh, and they can present multiple uh, virtual ports towards the towards the host of the PCI bus, uh, and then so there's a switch on that card. Uh, currently, there are a couple of Netlink APIs that you use to configure the uh, address. Uh, you 
that you use to configure switching of packets uh, between those local ports and the, uh, the external ports. And finally, the, the Linux has always had a software bridge driver for a long time, um, and that would you would configure using the Netlink API uh, bridge and uh, the uh, bridge or the archital uh, command. So these are all switches, but they all have different ways of uh, configuring them, which is not really ideal. So the switch dev concept has been introduced, uh, and it allows all of the all, every driver for a switch um, uh, should implement the same set of option, same set of operations, uh, some of which are optional, and the kernel will then uh, present the same interface to uh, user land, uh, so they can be configured in the same way, whether they're software, hardware, and uh, whether the switch hardware is smart or not so smart. Uh, so currently, it's not supported by all the drivers uh, that you would want it to be. It's there's the Intel 10 and 40 gig Ethernet uh, card support. It Q Logic supports it. There's this thing called Rocker, which is a uh, a switch that's emulated in QMU, which is not terribly useful except as a test bed for for this uh, this new API. And there's the Mac VLAN, which is the uh, alternate kind of uh, software bridge. Uh, every port on a switch now gets its own net device, and you can use Ethertool to configure the things like uh, speed and auto negotiation on those network ports. Um, and then use the bridge command. Uh, will now work with the hardware bridges as well as software. The um, hardware can do learning uh, like it figures out which MAC addresses are attached to which point, which port, or it can let the uh, the software deal with that. Uh, and it's even possible to offload layer three, so IP level uh, uh, forwarding decisions to the hardware. Wrong way. Uh, so something that's ongoing uh, in graphics, uh, so not completed yet, quite away from being completed. Uh, something called atomic mode setting. So you probably know about kernel mode setting. Uh, this is making the kernel responsible for managing the uh, setting up the uh, your video display generators and managing memory on the uh, for the graphics hardware. And that removes the need for previously the X server or the X uh, video drivers inside the server were doing all of this from user land, which was really not great. Uh, the so there's now there's a uh, kernel subsystem called DRM, which is Direct Rendering Manager. Originally, it was all about uh, the uh, 3D GPUs, but it now takes care of this uh, mode setting and memory management as well. So it models as your your display generator as having several pipelines. The pipelines take input from frame buffers, or also called planes. So you have one frame buffer for the the uh, kind of the pretty much everything you see on screen. In fact, uh, you have another plane which ha has the mouse cursor that's uh, shown on top of that, and you might have other planes for uh, showing video on top of that because video is special, uh, uh, and the video plane can can provide uh, scaling and color space conversion in hardware. Now, if you're using a, uh, if you're using a uh, graphics uh, chip that has a 3D GPU, actually, uh, you probably don't have a video planes anymore uh, because the GPU can handle all of that. Uh, when compo uh, composers together uh, windows, um, and it compo can compose in video and do the scaling in the same way as it can do kind of uh, 3D rendering. Um, and then the output of a pipeline can be routed to one or more screens. Uh, so at the moment, for example, uh, my laptop has a single pipeline, I think, which sends the same signal out to the internal, uh, the internal display 
and out of the BGA port. There's, there are differences in the encoding there, but it's effectively it's, it's, it's the same signal internally. Um, so when I plug and unplug the uh, uh, projector, uh, the this pipeline needs to be reconfigured uh, to talk to two rather than one port, two ports rather than one. Um, and KMS is, is supports doing that, that's fine. Um, you can change the refresh rate as necessary. Um, and you can add and remove uh, uh, planes, for example, when you close, open and close your uh, video player. Um, but these changes, uh, reconfiguring can result in uh, flickering of the screen or tearing where you have uh, one half of the screen generated with just on one update of the free screen, you could have one uh, one half generated with the old configuration, one half with the new, and there's this odd join in the middle. It only appears for a moment, but it's slightly annoying. Um, and also because you uh, the changes are uh, broken up into multiple steps, uh, you could get a configuration halfway through that is invalid. For example, it requires too much memory bandwidth. Uh, so even though the um, X server is is trying to con reconfigure to a state that's completely valid, this intermediate step might not be, and then that fails completely. Now, I don't um, I don't plug and unplug uh, the projector very often, so why should I really care about whether there's flickering or, or whatever? Uh, well, it turns out that Using the GPU to do all your composition uses a f more power than uh, combining multiple frame buffers uh, at the display generator. So uh, this is uh, Android, for example, is making much more use of uh, composition at the display generator instead of the GPU. Now, Android has done its own thing. It's not using KMS. Uh, it doesn't support. Uh, multiple pipelines at all. Um, but you're going to see, hopefully, you're going to see mobile devices and hopefully you want your, sorry, you're going to see hopefully mobile devices using a normal Linux uh, uh, stack, graphic stack, and also you probably want your, your laptop to run for longer using less power. So it would be really nice to make more use of uh, multiple layers. Uh, in X uh, or Wayland. So yeah, the Windows system was going to need to reconfigure planes more often, and that means we really don't want them to flicker. So the atomic mode setting API uh, makes the reconfiguration transactional. Uh, either all the changes are applied, or uh, the driver detects that this isn't going to work and rejects the request from user land. And all those changes, if they're applied, they can be had can be carried out during a vertical blank period, i.e. Uh, between, not while the screen is actually being updated. So you have one frame with the old configuration, the next frame with the new configuration. Um, so the, the, the graphics drivers in the kernel need to be updated, so that they support <coughs> this. Not many of them have been. i915 for Intel hardware is, I think, supposed to be completely updated in Linux 4.2. MSM and Tegra, which are used on some uh, ARM-based SSCs, those have been updated. Uh, and UserLand will also need to use this new interface. Um, so that's going to take a while. Hopefully, hopefully we'll, it'll be ready and we'll have lower power graphics in, uh, in Stretch. So live patching. I've had a few questions about live patching and can we use it in Debian? Well, maybe. Um, so if you don't know, about, don't know about live patching, currently if you uh, upgrade the kernel uh, to, uh, you can't simply switch over to running the new code, you have to do a full reboot or possibly use KXEC. Um, if, your, if your applications are all containerized and uh, you've embraced the cloud, then uh, no problem, you can, you can kill, you can reboot VMs any time, it's not going to be disruptive. Uh, but if you ha have a more con more conventional uh, servers, then yeah, you have to schedule reboots, and 
you don't have to do them too often. But if there's an important security update, you really want to apply that. So live patching offers a way to uh, fix some bugs uh, by editing the kernel code uh, without a reboot. Uh, that was implemented quite a while ago by a company called KSplice with a product of the same name. They've since been bought by Oracle. Uh, their, their patches are free software, uh, but as far as I know, the tools they use to develop them are not. They don't develop in the open. And currently, they release patches for Oracle's Linux and Fedora and Ubuntu, not Debian. Red Hat and Suzy um, each saw this as an important feature for their uh, enterprise distributions, RHEL and, and Slayers, and so they implemented live patching again, and because they uh, actually work with the Linux community. Uh, they try to get these. Uh, they try to get their implementations up upstream at around the same time, uh, and then they have to go through some discussion and compromise on some sort of uh, on a um, on uh, a, an implementation that would suit them both. That's now happened in Linux 4.0. So yeah, it would be really nice to to use this feature in, uh, for Debian's kernel security upgrades, but. Uh, Naturally, it'll require more work. Uh, not everyone's going to use live patching, um, so so we're going to need to ship both the full kernel update and the live patch. And building the live patch is uh, it's extra work. So there's five minutes till questions, right? Yeah. Um, so if anyone wants to help the kernel team and work on this, or if anyone wants to pay a member of the kernel team to work on this, we'd be interested to hear from you. So uh, on storage, uh, we have some exciting new hardware, non-volatile DIMMs, because flash storage or flash storage arrays uh, get faster and faster, mostly by putting more flash chips in parallel. Um, and there are several interesting non-volatile memory technologies that are in development, uh, promise anytime soon, and supposedly they're going to be faster and more durable than flash. Uh, so up till now, non-volatile memory has usually been treated as a disk. It's attached to a uh, SATA interface, um, or there's a newish uh, interface called NVMe, which is uh, based on PCI Express, but maybe that's still not fast enough. So uh, NVDIMMs let you attach non-volatile memory to the memory bus, same bus as the uh, dynamic RAM is attached. Um, you still have the problem that uh, flash can't be rewritten that many times, not as many as RAM, uh, before it, it breaks. It stops holding uh, data. Um, so there are two different, two different ways of, of dealing with NVDIMMs. One of them is you map this whole block of memory, uh, block of flash memory, into the ordinary physical memory space, um, and then you can directly map, and then you can map that using the uh, MMU into the processors that are accessing uh, data on that NVDIMM. Uh, that's that's called the persistent memory or PMEM mode, and then there's the BLK or block mode, um, where uh, only the kernel accesses the memory directly and it uses several, uh, it only accesses a small portion of the time. Um, you can also compromise and, and spit on it your NVDMs into two regions that are accessing either mode. Hang on, I was going to, I've got that. There we go. Right. So the second, um, yeah. So with persistent memory, you, uh, you have direct access from processors. Uh, but if the hardware fails, those processors are, are going to crash, basically. Uh, no way to recover from that. Um, and you also need the file system to support direct access. But X4 and XFS support it, so that's probably good enough. The block mode uh, is not as efficient, but you can put a RAID layer over multiple MVDIMs, so it's more more reliable. <coughs> so hang on, going backwards, yeah, uh, we've got 
uh, in the encryption layer in Exit 4. Um, now, we already have an encrypting file system called EcryptFS. It's been there for ages. Um, so you may wonder, why would we need another implementation? There are good reasons for this. Uh, and in fact, uh, uh, encryption in Exit 4 is being implemented by one of the developers of EcryptFS. So he knows, he knows what trade-offs are. Uh, currently, when you read through EcryptFS, uh, all the data you read is cached twice in memory, uh, encrypted and decrypted. So there's some wasted memory. Um, and EcryptFS can't assume very much about the underlying file system, uh, whether it supports extended attributes uh, and so on. Um, and that means it has to deal with, sometimes it can store metadata in extended attributes, sometimes it has to use another approach. So it's more complicated and less efficient. Uh, putting this in the file system layer also means uh, there's no need for users to be able to mount before before they can use encryption. Uh, the implementation in ext4 uh, allows it to be turned on per directory, and you can have different key for each uh, a different key for each directory. Um, F2FS is adding the same interface. Uh, part of the reason for that is uh, Android wants this, and some some Android some Android devices. Devices use AXT4, some of them use F2FS. Okay, I've got some more things to talk about, but I'll, I'll open up to questions, and then if there's time uh, after the questions, I can, I can go through those. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, for talking. For talking. Okay. All right. I thought it was 45 minutes and then a 15 minute break. Okay, then I have 10 minutes for questions. And if I run out of questions, I can talk some more. Any questions? Any questions? Uh, the multi-queue functionality which was added recently in the Linux kernel, is it enabled by default for Debian, or uh, when do you plan on it? Sorry, what, which functionality? The block multi-queue functionality that was added for the block and the SCSI um, driver? You have to, there's a runtime control for it in the SCSI driver. Yes. Uh, I think it's a module parameter. It's not turned on by default upstream, and it's not turned by, on by default in Debian. Okay. You have to opt in. Thanks. Questions? To what extent can uh, X4 encryption replace Luke's block device encryption? Uh, for some users, yes, it can replace that, but it's a different deals with a different threat model. There's, a few, there's an article on LWN that goes into quite a bit of detail about what this is for and what it can and can't do, and it'll, I think there's a link in the comments there to the uh, public design document um, from Google about what, what they needed from this. Like, for instance, if I encrypt the whole file system, including from root downwards, can then the user encrypt their own files on top of that? Yes, yes of course they could, yes. There's nothing that you can do encryption. You can have as many layers of encryption as you want. Okay. Any more questions? Uh, there are lots and lots of drivers uh, um, upstream has the new process for upstream is they put lots and lots of drivers in the staging, staging tree, mm -hmm. and then um, eventually based on how the individual device developers uh, be, uh, maintain them and how the quality of the drivers are, they eventually uh, you know, progress them to the mainline tree I mean, in the same kernel. Mm -hmm. uh, what, does Debian have a policy about the drivers which are in the staging area? Uh, the current policy is that they may be enabled on request, 
but uh, drivers in other areas tend to be enabled uh, as a matter of course if they're for uh, something generic like that's uh, um, something like a USB drive device that you could plug into almost any system. That If it's outside the staging area, then we'll probably enable that driver uh, without thinking. But if it's in the staging area, there's some risk associated with it. You know, it might, might eat your hardware. Probably not. Yeah. Any of them could eat your hardware. But the staging is a bit considered a bit more risky. Uh, also, some of that code is not very portable. So generally, we'd enable it only for... If it was requested, we'd enable it for x86 only. In the title, you mentioned missing features. Which, what did you mean? Um, mi uh, missing features in, in what? You mean the, the right at the beginning? I guess it was features missing from Debian. Yeah. Uh, so. The bottom, this one. It was um, in the May title, perhaps. Uh, oh yes, and uh, what's missing, Debbie? Yes, yeah, so this is about integration and and, and packaging things. Um, and ooh, right. So, yeah. Um, The features I've, I've talked about so far, it's mostly going to be about uh, applications taking advantage of these, these things. Um, um, and then for overlay FS, uh, that's going to need, so uh, Debian Live uh, needs to be changed, or possibly has been changed actually, I'm not sure. Uh, but any live distribution is going to have to, to uh, Either they're going to have to repackage a UFS, or they're going to have to switch from a UFS to overlay FS. Um, so, yeah. life patching, you know, as I said, that needs a lot of work to actually use it. So it's usable, but uh, there the feature no is. Um, I'm not sure whether I actually turned or it's actually, whether it's actually turned on in the Debian kernels at the moment, but um, it's um, yeah. I mean, it's, it's not something you can use today in Debian. You've had the features there in Linux. In the sense that the kernel team doesn't support uh, doing kernel upgrades or stable updates by live patching. I'm, I'm sorry, could you speak a little louder? Or bring the microphone up to your mouth? Uh, uh, in the sense that uh, the kernel team does not support the upgrading sta stable kernels via live patching. Yeah, that's but, right. But uh, I could still use it for, for my own purposes. Uh, yes, was you would need to, you would need to have the expertise and the time to construct these patches. And if you do, please join the kernel team to, to do that. <laughs> More questions? Um, something that is not yet in the kernel, that is GRSEC. Uh, status, progress, somebody's working on that. Uh, do we have any chance to see it sometimes in Debian? If you look very closely, you could see that I actually uh, extracted one little feature from GRSEC and put it into the uh, into 4.1. Uh, but are we going to include it wholesale? No. It's a very big patch, and uh, you need a lot of changes. To, well, you need a fair number of changes to user land as well. Uh, it has performance costs. It's go not going to... Um, we can't assume that the GS security upstream would support it. In fact, it specifically said, no, I don't want to deal with uh, combining GR security with other distribution patches. So, sorry, 
Um, there's nothing to stop you taking uh, a supported GR security branch, uh, adding that on top of the upstream kernel and um, and running that together with Debian user land. With the overly FS and uh, the, as you said, the EU FS uh, uh, integration will be begun. I mean the packaging from Debian. Is the new one, the replacement, actually good enough for practical use, or the things you were saying or showing are showstoppers? What are your feelings about this? So far as I know, they're not showstoppers. Last question. No questions? Then thank you very much for your talk and see you again. Thank you.